So the plan was at 1.30. Uh, we're good, son. We're going, running, etc. Then I'll just keep yapping. So at 1.30, we will now start uh, the panel, public money, public code. After this, at 2.15, we will have a talk by Gillian York, um, titled Our Not-So-Secret Future. After that, we'll have a 15-minute break in which we want to do a group picture, most likely outside, but that's being figured out now. And you can all grab another drink if you want. After that, at 3 o'clock, we will start the lightning talks, which will last until 4 o'clock. Then there's another break, more drinks, slight lunch. And at 4.30, we start the first Nextcloud workshop, which is getting started contributing to Nextcloud. At 5.30, we do the second and last workshop, uh, developing apps for Nextcloud. And after that, it's time to get our uh, bodies to the beer garden. So that's it. Um, public money, public code, that's where we start. No, I think, I'm, I think we all need the microphone. Thank you, Joes. Yeah, welcome again. I think that was a nice lunch, and I hope you enjoyed it. And to wake you up from the post-soup coma, we have a wonderful panel here for you, where I'm very happy to welcome four members which, will be, which I will introduce to you after a short video. My name is Markus Fallner. I'm a journalist from Heise IX magazine here in Hanover, Germany. And uh, the topic of this panel is uh, public money, public code, which has been uh, yeah, a little buzzword in the open source community until it became an official request. And now I'm very, very happy that, we ha that this is getting more and more momentum and I am hoping that this will get a, not much, well, a much bigger topic in not only German, also European politics. I would like to start, we have 45 minutes, so I would like to have this panel like about 30 minutes. So the first five minutes will be, or three and a half minutes, something like that will be a video, which the FSFE was uh, uh, so great to produce. I guess it's a year or two years old, but it's... Uh, Perfect video to explain what this public money, public code is all about. After that, we will have a short introductory round about the four wonderful people that are sitting right here in front of you. And after about 30 minutes, I think we will have a session of Q&A with hopefully good and th thoughtful questions from the audience. And so that is my plan. And feel free to interrupt us anytime except for the video because we have... a wonderful technical setup that will pre pre uh, yeah, prevent audio, <laughs> present, provide audio for you. And so I hand over the microphone to our first class engineering audio technician, Joss Portfleet. Applause for him, please. Okay. All right. Imagine for a moment our government would treat our public infrastructure like our streets and public buildings the same way it treats our digital infrastructure. Our members of parliament would work in a rented space where they weren't allowed to vote in favor of stricter environmental laws because the owner, a multinational corporation, didn't allow that kind of voting in its buildings. Nor will it allow a long overdue upgrade to more than 500 seats. This means some members of parliament have to stay outside in the street. And a couple of blocks away, a brand new gym is already being torn down just six months after it was built. It's being replaced with an exact replica at great expense. And the only difference, the new manufacturer also provides streetball as an added feature. Meanwhile, every night through a hidden back door in the city hall, documents that contain sensitive information on citizens, from bank data to healthcare records, are being stolen. But no one is allowed to do anything about it because searching for back doors and locking them would infringe the signed user agreement. And as absurd as this sounds, when it comes to our digital infrastructure, things like the software and programs that our governments are using every day, this comparison is pretty accurate. Because mostly our administrations procure proprietary software. This means a lot of money goes into licenses that last for a limited amount of time and restrict our rights. 
we aren't allowed to use our infrastructure in a reasonable way. And because the source code of proprietary software is usually a business secret, finding security holes or deliberately installed backdoors is extremely difficult and even illegal. But our public administrations can do better if all publicly financed software were to be free and open source. We could use and share our infrastructure for anything and for as long as we wanted. We could upgrade it, repair it, and remodel it in any way to fit our needs. And because the open source in free software means that the blueprint is openly readable for everyone, this makes it much easier to find and close security holes. And if something practical and reliable was created digitally, not only can you reuse the blueprint all over your country, but the actual thing itself can be deployed anywhere, even internationally. A great example of this is Fix My Street. Originally developed in Great Britain as a free software app to report, view and discuss local problems like potholes, it's now being used all over the world. Everyone benefits because new features and improvements are shared by everyone. If all our software were developed like this, we could stop struggling with restrictive licenses and could start thinking about where and how software could help us. We could concentrate on creating a better society for everyone. So, if you think that tomorrow's infrastructure should be in our own hands, help us now by sharing this video and visiting our website, publiccode.eu. It's time to make our demand. Public money, public code. good yeah yeah you have a short applause for the fsfe for that video i i know it's r probably running through open doors here for this audience yeah but what this video really makes uh, a great thing in my opinion is that it addresses and is understandable for let's let's say ordinary people or as some, a good friend of mine used to say, for children and manager. And uh, <laughs> so I am happy to, to welcome on this board. Uh, let me see, how do, you, how do you sit? What's the lineup? Okay, so here, our chief audio technician and wonderful community manager. Marketing, hmm? Marketing. Marketing man manager. Okay, for the next cloud, Joss Portfleet. You all know him, I guess. Next is Tim. Tim Schrock from the uh, Deutsche Bund Jugendring, which is like the Na National Youth Council of the Federal Republic of Germany, correct? Next is Katharina Meyer, who is from the Open Knowledge Foundation Network, correct? Yeah. And thanks for the great video, Alexander Sander from the Free Software Foundation Europe. And uh, I, I'd like to start with a short introductory round where my friends can explain what they're doing and I start with a question to Alexander. And how much money are we talking about on a, on, a, on a European or German scale when we talk about public money, public code? Does the FSFE know how much in public instances or administrations are investing across the pond? Um, actually, uh, neither the FSFE nor uh, the governments know it exactly. And so that's why the European Commission just uh, published a tender um, where they are asking for um, scientists to make a study on this and to figure out um, how much money and how the ecosystem of, of um, open source and free software um, looks like in Europe. But um, we have some figures. And so, for example, in Germany, we... Um, we let's say, waste um, like 75 million every year just for Microsoft uh, licenses. So we have yeah, lots of mo a lot of money which we could invest uh, in, in uh, free software. And that's why uh, two years ago, the Free Software Foundation Europe started this campaign, Public Money, Public Code. And um, we already achieved to um, get like 
nearly 200 organizations to sign this campaign, also some administrations like Barcelona, for example, signed this campaign. And so there is a, a, a lot of progress in Europe, uh, in the member states, but also on the European level. And uh, I think we can see that um, yeah, governments more and more understand that free software is a good solution and that they are wasting a lot of money for licenses. And um, yeah, but we have to keep on with our fight and um, yeah, convince um, from the local government um, to the national uh, until the European government to, to switch to free software in general. And, and what are you doing at the FSFE especially? So I'm, I'm the policy manager at FSFE, so I'm um, yeah, taking care that um, yeah, in the end the legal text uh, is good for the free software environment. Cool. I hand the microphone over to Katarina. And from the Open Knowledge Foundation, what is your profession? What are you doing there? Um, within the Open Knowledge Foundation, I work at a project that is called Prototype Fund. And in a way, we're already implementing what you are calling for with the help of the uh, German Research and Education Ministry. Um, we have a funding and research program that provides money for open source project, uh, projects that um, somehow follow the public interest. And uh, I very much see that under the framework of critical digital infrastructure that should be open to everyone. And within four years, we provided 4.8 million to 118 projects, uh, amongst them also one from the Nextcloud community so far. Um, I was at a, at a KDE Nomi conference once and there was a professor on stage who said the biggest problem in education today in IT education is we teach use not code is that related to the work of the of the open knowledge foundation also because you mentioned education <laughs> In a way, yes. We also have a project that is called Jugendhakt that is addressed at teenagers. Um, we created the prototype fund more because we um, acknowledge that there's a lot of open source developers that work on critical digital infrastructure in their spare time. And uh, in a way, it was self-exploitation. So um, we wanted to fix the upstream problem a little bit and not that like freelance work and working your spare time on projects that you want to work on is bad, but it can't be the base on that we interact also with the government that uses these projects. So, And also, Tim Schrock here is involved in uh, youth, in working with you, uh, young people, youth people, because of the, uh, the National Youth Council. And my question to Tim is, uh, well, just tell the people what, what you're doing in your daily work and then maybe you can tell us what, what kinds of software we are talking about, the sizes or, or, or the, how many, um, um, the, not the sizes, I'm sorry, the, the addresses, who do we are, who are aiming at as users? I, um, I don't work directly with uh, young people but with organizations that uh, have uh, youth projects. And um, our aim is uh, to provide digital tools for people who can't participate, who are, not, who, to, who are too young to vote, for example. And uh, the funny thing is we receive public funding for that, like mainly from the youth ministry. And uh, it always collides with the interest of open sourcing things because the youth ministry thinks that open sourcing means uh, giving it away to someone who they don't know. Mm -hmm. So, and... Last one on, on this panel, Joss Portfleet, I think you must be the bad guy then because we always we have all those people that are for open source and for public uh, code for and so I'm o I've always been looking for somebody who is against it, but actually there doesn't seem to be somebody, right? Well, at least as head of marketing, I'm supposed to be evil. So <laughs> let me give it a try from that perspective. I, I find it fascinating to hear that every year 75 million is spent on Microsoft licenses. I think if you talk to the people from only Office or Collabra here, they can probably tell you that they can write that co code mm -hmm. twice a year for that money. Uh, <laughs> and then there's 4.8 million, I think it was, that is spent then on a whole bunch of projects, which means it gets, I mean, it's great, don't get me wrong, but of course it gets spread out in many ways in many places. And it's, it's a little frustrating because we're literally just throwing money in this big black hole um, now, I know that the youth organization um, is, or that, that you guys are using Nextcloud, and that's really cool. And, you know, I think 
again, the marketing guy, I mean, I've been around open source for a long time. I've been promoting open source, and that's essentially how I see my job now here at Nextcloud. And of course, at Nextcloud, as you probably notice here, we are a company and a community. And the way we see it is we try to use the company to build and enable the community. And by servicing our customers, of course, we can help also private users. So we do a lot of projects where we try to get, well, everyone on Nextcloud, even if it might not benefit the company. Um, and it would be nice if governments would have a, well, let's call it a similar view on this. And I think the video made that point really. I've, I've never seen it, honestly. I really should have. And I found it fascinating to see the arguments made is of course all very obvious to me, as was pointed out by Marcus. And it's just sad that this is not more widely acknowledged. And I guess an explanation for children and managers and let me out politicians was uh, very much welcome. I hope this works and that we can, we can do something together. You know, because it doesn't even have to be, again, I think Prototype Fund is a really good approach. And, but of course, as government, I understand that you're often in a certain system, you're used to working in a certain way, you don't want to open source things, you don't know where the code is going. And I really hope also that open source businesses like Collabora and, and only Office and of course Nextcloud can play a role in this because we can provide this familiar thing of we'll send you an invoice and at the same time of course that money goes, goes into open source. And yeah, I hope that that is one of the ways in which we can help solve this problem a little bit by working together, I think, um, in this area. Tim, what is, what is preventing, if it, is all, if it all is so, open, uh, open, so visible and so, so, if it is such a, a commonplace, because as we are sitting here, for us, it's, it's obvious. Yeah? But what is hindering uh, the obviously, or as we perceive it, better solution to get into, to become a reality I mean, you, you told me stories about local levels and, and software and all the obstacles that your, your, I say, mostly customers, even though they are administrations, have to surmount. So what is it that is hindering this obvious thing to become reality? I think it's uh, different on, on the national level and on the municipality level. Uh, on the national level, it's, um, well, in 2014, we tried to open source one of our consultation tools. And the ministry really did not understand what open source means. They asked lawyers, came back to us and really said like, okay, um, but uh, the procurement laws actually say you have to give, or the, the, um, the grant uh, regulations say you have to give back the using rights to us and how can it be that someone else uses it? And then we agree, it, uh, we agree on, on it if you tell us beforehand who will use it in the future. But just imagine, I mean... Luckily, there is Firefox, and even people in the ministry knew Firefox. And I explained with this example, so how do you think, or do you really think that people of the, the programmers for Firefox knew beforehand who will use it in the end? That actually convinced them in a way. But um, it's just a misunderstanding in many things, I guess. It's not that they're totally against it, because when they, under, they realize, ah, it's actually cool that no, not every group, every municipality has to reinvent the wheel, then it's actually cool for them. They are a bit afraid that uh, companies could just make money out of public funding. So they use the source code and then just uh, do something else with it. Uh, even when you try to explain there's different licenses and uh, there's different approaches to that, there's possibilities. That's also um, they're afraid of. And on the, on the municipality level, we often have the problem that Okay, my counterpart is usually the, the youth administration, the Jugendamt. And for them, if they even try to have a digital consultation or any digital project online platform, it's anyway really difficult for them to st get started with it. Like having someone who does the coding and everything and then forcing them to uh, open source it and putting it on GitHub or something, that is just too much for them. They just don't understand it. I don't, say, I don't want to say it's wrong that uh, they should... I mean, I, I support uh, the public money, of course, but um, for them, it's just too much. They, they need a lot of help and support for that. So it's like an, it sounds to me like a knowledge uh, hurdle or a knowledge problem. And you, you smiled when he was speaking, I guess that Katarina has made the same experience or has heard things that, or, or was it completely different maybe? Like, I don't know 
way, we had it way easier because the research ministry, they already work with an open access strategy. So if you receive f funding for a paper or if um, yeah, your whole chair is funded, then you also have to um, publish everything you write in that project and then open access, um, yeah. Mark, and then um, in a way, it was only the digital translation, so it was way easier to convince them that you today it's not you don't earn the money or the revenue um, via the software, but with the service and everything around it, and they they have an understanding of this, so um, they were very much open minded, and of course. Prototype Fund is a good project, but if you compare it to research and development budgets everywhere and in the innovation framework, it's really too little. So we would be happy if other ministries would join in to the strategy because we have to cover everything um, from health apps to um, like civic tech and um, it's only one fund at the moment. So I guess... We are at the beginning of a campaign of a campaign to to of sort of like en enlightenment uh, that would be too far fetched I guess but of of, of still in the phases of explaining things to people I guess is that also what the FSFE sees do you still have to explain why open source and uh, transparency is better than other solutions? Uh, yes, of course. So that's why we started this campaign because we we just figured out that um, yeah, there's um, a, a big lack of of knowledge. And um, for example, when it comes to communities, so governments see these hoodie taggart as a community and don't understand that they are the community. That a bunch of cities could be a community, a bunch of governments could be a community. So they don't, don't just have this picture in mind. So they just see like. They go to this conference and say, ah, oh, this Nextcloud community, everybody of these guys is coding with Nextcloud, everything is free and nobody can earn money with this. So this is the picture they have and this is where we have to work on. So and um, sometimes, so for example, when, when uh, Red Hot was uh, sold, so this uh, was a game changer because then people understand that you can earn billions of dollars with an open source company and it was very good for us in terms of lobbying to tell people hey you see I mean it's a big business and we are just sleeping here in Europe and uh, the business is done by anybody else uh, in the US so um, step in and um, yeah support your local IT community your local IT uh, industry by switching to open source and free software projects and um, Cities who does this, like Barcelona, for example, um, very successful with, with this. So um, they they introduce something like a like a law and say 70% of our T budget for for coding have to go into open source projects, and the result is that 60% um, of the coders are from the uh, from the region, and it's mostly SMEs, and so you can support your local IT industry by switching to free and open source projects. So, and this is how we try to convince then other local governments. Um, just how important is political back, uh, backup or backing for that? I've been involved a lot with the city of Munich yeah, through all their failures, through their success, and through, their, um, be, through them being sort of like ended, f yeah, more or less for political reasons. And as I see from a variety of projects that also the FSFE has reported upon, um, a, a large-scale open-source project in public uh, administrations has a higher probability of success when they have like an, 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 a patron or an angel, or how do you say this in English, that, that helps with that. And uh, so do, do you think this is right, that this is very important? And second question, uh, where are they? <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good question. That last part. Let me address that first. So what we what we see is, and I mean, I guess you could call it a strategy. I mean, the way Nextcloud comes into organizations, and that's true for both companies and government, is usually because the people in there, the individuals, some of them, use Nextcloud privately. So that, of course, helps our sales team incredibly because they come into an organization and at the table they have one or two or three people who are huge fans and are telling their boss, this is a great solution, this can help you. And they have already maybe even demonstrated it. And of course, in a political organization, um, I'm, I'm not intimately f 
familiar with all the conversations that we have there, but of course this also plays a role. Yeah, there are some politicians, thankfully, who are, well, let's say, geeky enough to actually run or be close to a running Nextcloud. Yeah, and this, this makes a massive difference. And to some degree, I always think, on one hand, it would be great if the product is the convincing factor, just being a better product. But of course, we all know and can mention some names where better products don't win. And, and this is, of course, even worse, I think, in government than anywhere else. I mean, our main competitor is this very big American company for which, the European, uh, for which Germany pays 75 million a year, apparently. And this company just pulls open a can of salespeople, you know, and we can do a few phone calls. But it's really hard at that level to compete with that. And you need organizations who uh, we can't afford to tell them the problem, explain them the problem, and, and then offer them a solution to the problem. If, if a government organization doesn't realize that what they're doing is bad, first of all, indeed for European business, and for the European government, and the European citizen, because that's what it boils down to, right? Putting all this money, as well as this data, as we talked about earlier today, to the U.S., it's bad for the citizens, it's bad for government because we lose a lot of money, and it is bad for, of course, European business you know, on many different levels. And as long as they don't realize this, like, we cannot sell this to them. Uh, we don't have the time, the resources to do this. We need you guys to, to do this, to help um, yeah, sell the problem, explain the problem, and, and find it. Um, but I think in a way we live in a special uh, point in history at this moment where you can deploy the hack of framing it under the European digital sovereignty way, which is special just as a brand, um, because there's this trade wars everywhere and we have problems with the GDPR and I think because it's this time in history, we have the chance now or never. I mean, our biggest gift ever is, of course, the whole mess around Facebook and others, right? I mean, the amount of awareness around these problems is bigger than it has ever been. And that's a huge boon to us as a, as a company and as a community, right? Because directly and indirectly, it you know pays for our drinks here. Um, and, and it helps, I think, the all, all of, of Europe because digital sovereignty is a big thing. And, you know, maybe it's not always the most efficient way that we go about it, but it is definitely helpful if you can put you know the problem in a bigger picture and and this is indeed yeah the digital sovereignty is is the bigger picture i think actually the two of you just said it a bit um next cloud is really helping uh, to support uh, strategies like public money public code because uh, because of the data privacy issues uh, people in the ministry and also municipalities uh, really start to understand why we are doing that and why we want to be emancipated from the US. Um, the funny thing is the word standard, for example, open standards is something that is, they don't understand it. It's like, why well, Excel is standard, so uh, why is it strange that volunteers maybe don't have Microsoft Office? And uh, the funny thing is, or a good thing on Nextcloud is, for example, we we did it in a hidden way, in a way, uh, offering Nextcloud together with Collabora. So people are start to use Open Document as a standard, even though they don't realize it. And uh, suddenly they realize, oh, there's different kinds of standards or different approaches. And that actually helps awareness raising. Yeah, I want, um, I mean, I also made good experiences with framing it under the whole innovation exp um framework that like a nation could be more innovative if you open up all the interesting technological concepts and don't like uh, hide them away in the ivory tower and that's also something that the government seems to be interested in so maybe go down that path Alexander do we do we hap happen to not hit the right wordings when we talk about stuff like that, because I just read between the lines that the word standard, for example, which for all of us probably here is pretty clear what we mean, huh? 
but I, I I see that I saw that also in companies where I worked that there that when people start speaking about Microsoft as an industry standard, and I'm like, no, <laughs> not really. But do we have do we need different wording in approaching people? Well, maybe sometimes, but uh, in general, I think we we are on the right way, and we have the, a good wording in place. Uh, I mean, for example, everybody of you say this video is very perfect, and this is my it's the same experience if I'm going to politicians or people who never ever heard of free software before, and they understand it afterwards. So I think it's it's fine. Also, we we have something like the Talent Declaration, which is signed by every member state in the European Union, where they agree on to use more open source software in the future. So we already have text in place, we have um, strategy papers, we have uh, whatever. So um, it's we, we have the the ISA Square program in the European Union, which is talking about um, in the operability and um, open standards. So. Um, people are somehow aware of it, but um, sometimes it's a political decision, like in Munich, and um, also there's uh, a lobbyist on the other side, so Microsoft have loads of uh, resources to, to do lobby campaigns, and we have a lack of resources. So in the FSFE, we are like 10 people, and it's uh, kind of hard to lobby like all European countries and the European Union on, from a local to national to European level, and Microsoft can easily... Does this so, and uh, I think it's more a lack of resources than a, a lack of communication. So I, I just had an idea when I hear lack of resources because I I was also involved in change management and I did migrations when I was uh, way before I was a journalist. As I said, I was involved also a little bit with the city of Munich. So my I will ask all of you one last question before we go into the open questioning phase. But that one will be um, think of it as a snowball system. Um, one, th one key learning in the city of Munich, when they, when after having little success, but, but then a lot of success within a few years, was they did a different uh, approach. They found a different approach of um, getting the new stuff on, uh, to the people, which is, imagine, Beamte, German uh, officers in administration, they don't want no change. Yeah? They're happy with an with a old-fashioned DOS and curses interface from the 70s as long as it doesn't change. Yeah? But um, when they found out how to approach them, they went in every team, spotted the one that is the technical guy, the one that is the guy that, or the lady that everybody goes to and asks what, how this is solved. So they gave them the new stuff. And th so everybody would eventually see, hey, this is the new stuff. What is that? Yeah, things work there. It's not yet done, but I am privileged. You know, I can see that and stuff. So that was a, like a snowball system that worked. I've seen this also in environment in, in, in a, a, in third world projects in Africa, you go into a village, you find the one guy that, that, that is known to spread this stuff. Huh? So we've got lots of people here. What is the one thing that you four think of what you would need or what we can, we can do or to spread the word or whatever um, about to make this more known? Because the other side that is not here, that is never here in these discussions, has lots of lobbies, lots of money running around so what would it be? Should we talk to politicians, think of it? Maybe you find something. So whoever starts has the better start because the others will already say, have said. <laughs> um, I think we need to spin around the narrative around how history of technology or development of technology really works, that it's like very rarely one single uh, engineer that has all the brilliant ideas and involve like more the view of community technology and what that could be and what potential lies in it. And um, we need to get more peop members of parliament uh, reading the book by Mariana Mazzucato, The Public Value, because she describes that everything that is patented and that we're paying for was already funded by the public hand anyway. And um, how much longer do we want to do this? Well, okay. Um, so... As part of the campaign, we produce this brochure, and this is for decision makers um, from a local, national, European level. You can order a hard copy of it, go to your local government, hand it over and tell them switch to free software. You can download a PDF and send an email, and you can send the video around and yeah, go to your local politicians and convince them to switch to free software, or if you know a member of the European Parliament or of any other parliament, go there, they have uh, offices, you can just go there in and try to talk to him, give them the brochure, show them the video and um, sign our campaign. I think we often need very concrete wordings. 
like for um, the English word, I don't know, Zuwendungsbescheid, that's, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or for the, <laughs> okay, it's uh, grant regulations, for example, uh, because we know that people in the ministries and so on, they're actually not always against uh, things, but they don't know the wording, they don't know what actually they have to write in order to make it possible. So that is uh, the thing we want to prepare together with lawyers, maybe with you. Um, and on the other side, what we could need, and I'm looking at yours and all here, continue with the great uh, Nextcloud development because it actually convinces people that open source software is so much cooler. I know what he's going to say. Yeah, I think building a, <laughs> building a good product helps a lot. Um, I agree. But I also do really like what you said about the right words. I think that connecting to the way the politicians currently think, and I mean, let's be honest, they have largely been potty trained, of course, by big proprietary software vendors, yeah, who have taught them that, you know, copying is theft and, you know, well, just make a list of all the things that is not good and that is good standards indeed, right? Microsoft being a standard is, well, in many ways, of course, a joke. And... You know, trying to find the right terms. I think this focus on, on sovereignty is really great. And the focus on open innovation, I think, is also really brilliant because there is, sadly, a lot of nationalism growing in Europe. But, you know, maybe there is a slight positive edge to it, at least in this area. And I'm definitely enough of an evil marketing guy to happily capitalize on that, even though I otherwise don't really like this trend, as I'm more of a European than a... Dutch, I mean, hell, I'm Dutch who lives in Germany. And, but yeah, the words, I think, is really important. Um, and another thing you really notice a lot, the misconception is that open source either means it's free, as in money, so suddenly when you have an open source solution, the budget disappears, which is really fascinating and, of course, highly annoying. And, or controversially, you know, there's no problem spending massive, massive amounts of money on SAP and on Oracle and solutions like that. And then like a fraction of that would be needed for an open source solution to implement it properly, to get support for it, to maintain it and improve it. And then, no, there's no money. It's open source. It should be free. Which is, of course, well, first of all, incredibly counterproductive and pretty stupid because you're just wasting money and then you have something that actually you can build on, right? I mean, every line of code you pay for and add to an open source project continues, A, to be yours, continues to be available for everybody else. I mean, what the heck are you doing, you know, if you put your money in, in a proprietary piece of software and, you know, a year after you paid, they can just take it away from you, right? And in open source, you pay once and that's it. Isn't that like a hundred times better investment? It's just frustrating. So yeah, we need to get this across. Call it an investment, calling it, I don't know. It's maybe people here have suggestions for good words. Oh, that, that is a one, wonderful bridge. Thank you. <laughs> so I take it that we have a make politicians read, for example, the book, The Public Value. The, the FSFE has done a great job with this uh, campaign, with spreading the word and the video. Also, Tim said, use concrete wording. Admins, uh, administrations don't always understand what is meant, right? And also, uh, just said, we need the right words and we need to connect to politics. So, and with, with this, I open this for, for your questions to the panel. This is a chance. So, raise your hand if you have a question that you would like to have discussed. Oh, maybe you need to have... Yeah, there's one. Shall I... Or do you just say it and I repeat it? I think that's easier. Mm -hmm. uh, so the question is uh, regarding the massive amount of lobbyism and lobbying money that is spent in Brussels, what the approach, what the, the thoughts and uh, the strategy of the panel, the people on the panel, is uh, regarding uh, open source in Brussels and in the European Union. Did I put that correctly around about? 
Who wants to start? Maybe, maybe Alexander. Uh, you're, you know, FSFE is yeah. There's an E in FSFE. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 true, and um, yeah, that's why we heavily uh, work on the European level and uh, try to convince the European institutions to to switch to free software and uh, also to make um, laws that require um, free software and open source. And as I mentioned, for example, we have the talent declaration. Um, which states that all um, EU institutions, as well as the member states, they signed it, want to use more open source, whatever this means. And what we are now trying to lobby for is concrete numbers, like we want to have like 80% of the IT budget should go in open source project. That's what we are trying to do. Um, so it won't be too easy, but we can see it on a local level, for example, that um, there are also on a national level that there are all, already laws in place, like in France, Bulgaria, for example. Um, they are doing something like this, so it's possible. And um, so, and it, also during the copyright directive, which might seem strange, we had a big win for the open source um, 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 open source environment. So uh, we have an exclusion in the copyright reform for open source software, like code sharing platforms. And so during this lobby campaign, we managed it to like talk to loads of politicians uh, in regard of this uh, Article 13 or 17. And to get this exclusion for open source, so which means now lots of people in the European environment understand what open source means and what it does. And um, also we have the ISA Square project, for example, which is uh, regarding open standards. We have the FOSA project from the European Parliament and the European Commission. They are looking for, for, for bugs in um, heavily used um, software by, by governments and states. So there's a lot of progress there, but also, as I said, in the case of Munich, I mean, we have uh, heavy, heavy lobby resources from the other side, so Microsoft, Oracle, whomever. They have billions of dollars, and they spend a lot of money for lobbying, and these are more or less our enemies, and we are like 10 people. So, um, yeah, it's always good to support us or other organizations in, in Europe working on lobbying and um, trying to convince politicians to, to switch to free software. So help us help other organizations who are working on this. There are also national organizations in, in every member state, more or less, uh, which you can support. So this helps a lot. Does the, port, does the portal joinup.eu still exist? Yes. I used to write for them, and that was a brilliant idea. I thought it was not only open source, it was con con collaboration, con uh, cooperation in any way. And it was meant as a portal where specialists, and that was where I came in as a writer, uh, a journalist, would write about solutions that had been used, for example, in Gibraltar. And uh, the, the target of the portal was describing stuff that could be used in Finland, for example. So, okay. Just add one more thing. So one of the results of this, this is part of this ISA Square project. And it's yeah, exactly, it's still running. And so what they are doing now, for example, as well, is to do open source software awards. So they, um, like every two years, they try to figure out the best European open source project and give them a prize. So this is also something which is very good in, in, in order to create awareness and also in terms of networking and telling uh, governments that you are the community and that you should work together and that you should share your ideas and um, your best practices. So if a city A does a really good job with the um, with the street app we just seen in the video, share it with others. They um, might uh, use it as well. So normally governments ha having more or less the same things they need when it comes to software. So it's not like that they are doing totally strange things to, compared to another city or government, right? Um, I think not only governments need that software, but also like the European digital, digital civil society needs access. And I'd like to see Horizon 2020 just for civil society and the prototype fund on a European level, like with a big, big budget. And we try to make that happen, like we're already talking to politicians. Um, we have a European platform as well. And um, the lobby work we do, the best experience, I think, is... Well, youth organizations are usually not so conservative. They're more the other way. And uh, still, it's very uh, useful to speak, especially to conservative politicians, and also bring up real-life examples. 
like explain whatever grandma's secret recipe book and you can share it and no, nobody hits you on the fingers um, except for grandma and uh, such examples they really help that politicians under start understanding also like uh, the messengers it's one of the, of the very keen uh, core things public access to messenger services not just whatsapp and it's a golden cage um, they start understanding it if you compare it to real life examples in other areas We have one, no, none minute left. That makes it easier for me. Um, I would, yeah, ask yours as also being part of the host. What's your What's your European strategy? Yeah, well, we just try to sell to them. <laughs> ah, that's that's a little short. <laughs> but you know, I really liked um, the the idea. I think. So a lot of organizations like you guys are lobbying. I think that's really good. What I notice is that sometimes politicians, um, you know, they would like to not hear from lobbyists for once. And talking to politicians, and, and I have some friends who always tell me that European politicians are actually quite easy to approach for normal citizens. I would recommend people who care to do that. Because one problem that I have, I have been around open source for 15 plus years. I'm in a bubble. I find it impossible that you don't get that you are the community, as you said, right, as a government. I mean, come on, you're the user, of course you are, but yeah, at the same time, of course, I worked for government. I know they don't think that way. And I can try to get that message across, but for me, it is hard. I, I try to talk to the business world, and I know some of the business words, and that helps. But on a lobbying level, I think we at Nextcloud are, we try. I mean, I know Frank regularly talks to politicians here and there. So we definitely do our best, but I don't think we're very well equipped for it. But I think normal citizens, as in the people watching the stream and the people in this room, you are actually in a privileged position because you are not a lobbyist. And that gives you a massive benefit because they want to hear from you as citizen. So, sure, what you have to say might not be as polished as the professionals here at the table can say, but that itself often makes it stronger. So think about, you know, how maybe just when you're visiting Brussels, you know, there's this FOSDEM thing. Um, yeah, think if you can visit, you know, a politician who represents you or who you have some kind of connection with. Try to ping them on Twitter, try to talk to their staff, give them a call. They actually have people picking up. I mean, not always themselves, of course, but it is possible to make appointments with politicians. And if you come to Brussels, for example, for FOSDEM, or you come to Brussels for other reasons, or to Strasbourg, or try it. Try to talk to them. It's really worth it. Shoot an email. Well, there's another point, yes. So all you normal people out there, come to Brussels. There's lots of normal people at FOSDEM, I can tell you. <laughs> But they also have beer. Um, but uh, thank you very much. Time is up. I'm already two minutes over time. I'm very, very happy to uh, be followed by Jillian York. Hello. And uh, right here. So thanks a lot to all of you. I guess we will be around if you have any further questions during the next two weeks in uh, this building. And uh, <laughs> just one week. Okay, good. Thank you very much.